All right, CNT 140, we're looking at Chapter 2, and we're looking at the section on networks. So now as we move into networks, we're now going to be looking at, uh, you know, twisted pair cabling, fiber cabling, that kind of thing. All right, so they remind us network allows computers to operate together. So let's remember some things from 120. Um, network, group of computers, other devices, printer smartphones, Wii's, PlayStations, all that kind of good stuff, connected by some type of transmission media, copper wire, fiber up the cable, that sort of thing. Why do we have a network? If we remember back to mainframe computer days, mainframe was one giant computer that, one, kind, one giant CPU that all the terminals in the building were connected to. So we were all sharing this one giant computer is what it amounted to. As we moved on to personal computers, where we had our own computer on our desk, we did not have a way to move data around. We used sneaker net. We actually put data on a removable device, moved it between computers, floppy drives, that sort of thing. There, we needed a way to connect them all together. So we needed a network. And again, in the early days, Apple computers developed their own Apple network using their own Apple cable, Apple NICs, Apple protocols to move data around. IBM did the same thing. IBM computers, IBM cabling, using token ring network to move data around between IBM computers. And same thing with Xerox. Xerox had their computers. Xerox used their own cabling, their own NICs, and their own protocols, Ethernet, to move data between computers. Out of that, Ethernet kind of won the, the time war of it worked good enough that most things could work on it. Uh, it was cheap enough that most devices started porting or developing uh, network cards and so forth to be able to connect to the Ethernet network. And if we look at why we have a network, and actually that was for business environment, so that all of our different devices could share and or get to the internet. If I look at home, I have the same kind of scenario. We did the same thing over time, going from modems up to uh, having a router in our house. But really, that router, if I open it up and look inside, has circuitry where there's a switch, access point, firewall in there, giving me a small network that all my devices in my house connect together and communicate, and also allow me to get to the internet. So the same reason we have networks in business is why we have networks in our house. We mention all that because that is, when they say we have networks to share data, that's why we have it. That's why we have networks everywhere, businesses and houses and so forth. So with a computer network, we have things like analog signals, phones and televisions traditionally were analog signals. Um, computers were digital. Um, and as they say, your um, digital signals were immune to noise and tolerate attenuation better. Absolutely. That's why over time, things like phones and television have been converted and or sampled and converted into digital signals for movement across networks. Uh, networks were always traditionally uh, digital signals. To be able to connect to a network, each device needs to have some kind of network card, a NIC, to be able to communicate. So remembering hopefully what we do from 120, network card, NIC, network interface card, um, uh, that is there to be able to connect to a network and transmit and receive signals and data on a network. And if I look at a traditional Ethernet network, it's using the CSMA CD access method for moving data onto and off the network. And here it shows you all kinds of different things connected to a Ethernet switch. All these would need to have NICs in them. Here's a whole bunch of different types of wired NICs uh, going back from coax, fiber, twisted pair, uh, that I would have in machines to connect to networks. And here's a bunch of different wireless NICs, USB, uh, uh, PCI, PCIe for connecting into devices and getting onto wireless networks. Here's a NIC for a printer to connect a printer to a network. Here's NICs on the back of an IP phone to connect the IP phone to a network. Here's NICs integrated in the motherboard of my computer that my computer connect to the network. 
Here are, if I go back, older motherboards, expansion slots that allowed me to snap a network card into. Really old ISA slots, old PCI slots that I could snap a network card into, or PCI Express slots to snap a uh, network card into. That's probably the most modern. USB slots that I can snap a NIC into. PCMCIA slots in an old laptop that I could put a NIC into. And then here's an ISA NIC giving an idea of, of what it looked like, a big old ISA slot with a coax connector. Here's PCI slots for twisted pair Ethernet, PCI for uh, wireless network card. Here's PCI Express uh, for wireless. Here's PCI Express for wired Ethernet. Here's USB plugging right in, giving me a little dongle that I can plug into a wired network. Here's PCMCIA for a wireless card for a laptop. Um, here's PCMCIA uh, card for a laptop to be able to be on a wired network. Okay, You get the idea. Uh, network cards are quite important to attach any device to a network. And they come in, as you see, multiple configurations to connect all kinds of things over time to networks. The book then goes on to remind us about servers and hosts. Servers traditionally are central computer, uh, central point of storage, central point of control. Uh, this is the one, uh, th th this would be the computer. Yeah, I must, I'll, I'll finish my thought. This would be the computer that has uh, the ability to store files for all the users. This is all the computer that has the ability to set up permissions to say, yes, you can, no, you can't on this network. Yes, Doug Brown, you can save your file to your folder called Doug Brown. No, Doug Brown, you may not open folders on payroll. You are not. You do not have permissions to open those folders on payroll and change payroll. Um, the, the server has that functionality, too. Meanwhile, the host is your traditional uh, computer that you have on the desk that you're accessing the network with. Well, before we dig into that any further, let's remember peer-to-peer -peer model and client-server model. Your peer-to-peer -peer model, hopefully you remember from 120, we set up a small peer-to-peer -peer network. This is all the computers are acting as basically peers the same to each other, and we can set them up to share data back and forth. So I can set up folders and shares and move data around my network between these. And the control is done by the peers. Um, so it's minimal control, very low security, but ease of functionality in a small environment, in your home or in a small office. I don't need the complicated and expensive server to maintain all that. I can just move between the clients themselves. That's your peer-to-peer -peer model. That's what we did in our 120 lab, uh, if you had 120 on campus with us. The peer to peer advantage, simple to configure, really no cost to it. Uh, just a hub or a switch and a couple cables, and I don't need any special operating system. <coughs> Excuse me. Disadvantage is it's not flexible, it's not scalable, it's not really that secure, there is no central admin, and it's really not practical for more than just a handful of computers. Meanwhile, as they move on to the client server model, okay, they remind us about. Um, the, the, the network is managed by a network operating system. That is basically your server operating system on the server. That's the one that has the permissions to say, yes, you can, no, you can't, through things like Windows Server Active Directory. That actually has the permissions to say, yes, you can, no, you can't. Um, so when a user signs in, they are in here as a user in the system, and they're giving permissions to, yes, Doug Brown, you may sign on, or Doug Brown, no longer works here he's not allowed to sign on the network that's all controlled through the server in this case windows server active directory so with a client server model now we now have the server acting as the boss in charge with permissions in which you can and which you can't and here's a whole bunch of responsibilities the server is doing managing the resources, ensuring only authorized access, uh, controls user file access, restricts access, um, that sort of thing. And examples would be things like your Windows Server 2012, 2016, Ubuntu Server, Red Hat Server, Mac OS X Server. These would be the ones that are controlling the users in the network. So a client server, we now have uh, credentials in one central place. Uh, uh, all those resources can be controlled. This is scalable for a large company. You can deal with thousands of computers. It is much more secure, and I do have that central point of admin. 
downside is it is not simple to conf configure and maintain. You do need somebody to configure and maintain this. It is more expensive to set up and maintain, and I do actually need a server and a server operating system. I just That's just what I need. So then the book reminds us about network operating systems, so I'll remind you. Let's remember desktop operating systems. Well, desktop operating systems are things like your Windows OS, 331, 95, 98, ME, XP, 7, 8, 10. Okay. These would be your desktop operating systems, and the function of them is uh, the software that interacts with the hardware on your desktop to allow you to run things like Microsoft Office, run things like Internet Explorer, run things like um, uh, iTunes and, you know, programs that interface with the hardware that I'm dealing with. Things like your Apple OS, you know, your Tigers, your Leopards, your Mountain Lions, your Yosemite, your Sierras, okay? Things like your Linux OS, and here is a whole bunch of different Red Hat Linuxes, uh, Fedoras, that sort of thing, okay? Meanwhile, the server operating system, this is the one that's going to interface with the server hardware and going to do those functions of control, who can get on the network, and when Doug Brown signs on, if he's allowed, what does Doug Brown have access to? Well, he has access to this folder and this folder, not all of these other things that are out there. So your server operating systems are things like, yes, your Windows Server, uh, NT 2000, 2012, 2016, okay? If I move on the Linux side, things like your Red Hat Enterprise Linux servers and your Mac, Mac has their own Mac OS X server with all of their versions. And once upon a time, Novell Netware. Novell Netware was actually one of the first ones on the scene to do this. Novell Netware through the years, as well as its no op open enterprise server. Uh, and this changed over to open enterprise server after a bought SUS Linux. Okay. So, there is your server operating systems maintaining control or control of the network. So when we move from peer to peer to client server, we have the client, uh, as we move in the, from peer to peer to client server, the server operating system maintaining control of the network. They then remind us of network protocols, uh, and really they don't give you an example, but I'm giving you one, TCP IP. If you think back to when you learned the OSI model and then eventually TCP, all of these protocols are the language that the majority of networks speak today. Most networks use Ethernet and then use the TCP IP protocols to move data around. Things like FTP, things like TCP, things like HTTP, things like SMTP, they all come from the TCP IP protocol suite. So it's those protocols that we're using to move things around a network. Alrighty, we'll come back in the next uh, section and talk more about this, and we'll talk some topologies and so forth.